Hello, everyone. Welcome to the KIAA remote talk today. I'm Xiaoting Fu. This is our 21st remote talk this semester. Today, we are very happy to have the speaker, Zhi Xiang Yan from China's University, Czech Republic. The time is still early in Europe. Thanks, Zhi Xiang, for getting up so early to give us, uh, give us this talk. Zhi Xiang Yan is currently a third year PhD student working with Professor Pavel Krupa. He has just finished the first two years of his PhD in the University of Bonn, Germany, and moved to the Chalice University in Prague, Czech Republic. Zhi Qiang is mainly working on galaxy evolution, especially on star formation timescale, galaxy-wide IMF, the stellar initial mass function, and galaxy chemical evolution. Zhi Qiang has his own galaxy uh, chemical evolution code, and has tested variable IMFs in different galaxy environments. Today, Zhi Qiang is going to talk about his recent work on variable stellar initial ma uh, mass function and its implications on galaxy chemical evolution. Please, Zhi Qiang, take the microphone. Okay, so uh, first, thanks, Xiao Ting, for inviting me, and thanks for the introduction. And uh, um, hello, uh, everyone from Beijing, and uh, good morning for the uh, people joined from Europe. Um, I will talk about the uh, variable nature of the initial mass function and uh, its implications on galaxy chemical evolution, as you can see here in the title. This uh, talk is based on our recent work uh, uh, published uh, here and uh, in collaboration with uh, Pavel Kupa and uh, Teresa Yarkova. Um, so I will go to the introduction. History of uh, the measurements on stellar initial mass function. Um, basically, it's, it's a, a change of mindset from whether the MF is variable to now, uh, people try to constrain how does the MF varies. The second part of my talk, I will introduce the uh, IGMF theory, which gives an explanation of uh, IMF. And in the third part, we uh, implement the IGMF theory to the chemical evolution uh, model of galaxies. And finally, I will show two examples of uh, such uh, implications. So let's dive into the first part uh, on the history. So is the stellar initial mass function variable? And I will talk uh, separately for star clusters and galaxies. So because if the uh, initial mass function is not universal, then uh, it will be different for uh, different systems intrinsically. So the IMF for star clusters, uh, in theory, it's uh, very natural to assume that uh, the IMF will change depending on the physical uh, conditions uh, when the star forms. Uh, I will not go into the details of this series, but uh, in short, people find that the mentalicity of the uh, gas cloud that is going to form star and the star forming intensity should, in principle, affect the MF. But in observation, this is um, more complicated. Uh, you need to consider the stellar evolution, dynamical evolution, uh, the unresolved binary system in the star cluster. And also there are very few massive star massive stars that you can actually observe and uh, to determine the IMF. So uh, the fact is the uncertainty was too large to detect any IMF variation. And as you can see in this plot, basically there is some uh, development on the lower mass part of the IMF, but for the high mass stars, basically uh, the measurements are all consistent with the uh, initial function proposed by Sir Peter in 1950s. So in 2002, Cooper uh, proposed uh, this uh, alpha plot. So that is that contains the same information as this. Uh,
function is uh, alpha here. So at the times part, you see that uh, the measurements of different uh, stellar system are basically consistent with uh, the same uh, MF slope. Uh, in fact, you, you would expect a lot of IMF was even better than a universal IMF. Uh, I think the, the uh, green uh, histogram is the uh, uh, is the observations, and uh, in theory, if you have a universal IMF, you would expect uh, uh, something like the uh, blue histogram here. So, so that is uh, to show that the uh, uncertainty was either the uncertainty was uh, overestimated or the, there was a confirmation bias on the uh, universal IMF. During the uh, recent two decades, uh, I, can, I cannot go through all of them, but you are welcome to, to see a review here. Uh, by uh, Cooper and Hopkins. Recent observation showing that the MF is varying. And uh, this work done by Marx uh, et al. in 2012, in particular, studied the uh, radii of the global clusters and ultra compact dwarf galaxies and compare it with the uh, unbody simulations. So basically, you uh, the radii of a star cluster is related to its dynamical evolution and, and the dynamical evolution is uh, affected by the uh, energy and gas rele uh, released by the massive stars in a star cluster. So by comparing the uh, observation with the embodied simulation, you can give a constraint on the fraction of massive stars in the systems. And here you, you see, uh, the slope alpha three is again the MF slope of uh, massive stars. Uh, so up to a certain point, so so it's a function of uh, mantelicity of the star cluster and the core density. So up to a certain point is consistent with the canonical slope uh, of uh, two point three, and uh, above this uh, threshold is become a uh, Flatter, so there there is more uh, massive stars in the system, and this is uh, a very tight relation based on only uh, two uh, parameters. Another set of uh, most massive stars in a star cluster, as uh, uh, I collected in in this uh, work in two thousand seventeen. So uh, shown here is the uh, most massive star in the star cluster versus the uh, mass of the star cluster. So uh, if the uh, stellar mass are randomly sampled from uh, distribution, then you would expect uh, some star that uh, contain most, most of the mass of star cluster. So it will be lying uh, on this line here. So, so this is a one-to-one -one line if, uh, if there is only one star in the star cluster. So if the star stellar mass is randomly sampled, you would expect some star cluster lying in this uh, region here, but uh, the observation shows that it's not. So this, there is a tight relation between the uh, uh, mass of the most massive star and the mass of the star cluster. Now with these two relation, it is possible to uh, plot the uh, IMF variation of different star clusters with uh, different mass. So here I assume the mentalicity to be uh, solar mentalicity. And so this is uh, 
the, the core density of a star cluster is correlated with the uh, mass of the star cluster. So this is a function of uh, star cluster mass. Now uh, here, uh, the uh, so different colors uh, represent different uh, uh, represent the IMF of different star clusters. So here for star clusters with smaller mass, its uh, most massive star is uh, also uh, smaller. And for the uh, massive star clusters, it, it ends up at uh, here. So that is about 150 solar mass. And the slope of a uh, massive star cluster is also becoming flatter and uh, there uh, is expected to be more massive stars uh, than what you would assume with a canonical IMF. So there is a question about uh, this empirical relation uh, because we uh, utilize the unbody simulation and this, uh, this function is so this systematic uh, variation seems to be uh, real, but uh, exactly how much uh, uh, this slope changes uh, is uh, uncertain. So that, that, that depends on, your, uh, on the accuracy of uh, the embodied simulation. So that is uh, the variation of uh, a, MF of star clusters, and now I will talk about the MF of galaxies. So there is one uh, advantage of uh, looking at the galaxies uh, is because you, you no longer need to worry about the dynamic evolution uh, of uh, star clusters, uh, inducing stars and uh, or binary fractions uh, that you cannot uh, resolve because you, uh, you observe the total uh, integrated uh, luminosity of the entire galaxy. Now the downsides of this is that all the uh, indicators of IMF is indirect and the result depends on your assumed uh, stellar evolution model and especially the uh, star formation history of the galaxy. So there is uh, plenty of different uh, independent uh, ways to uh, this su su suggests that the galaxy-wide IMF cannot be uh, universal and uh, otherwise it cannot uh, explain some of the observations uh, I listed here. And I will only go into detail of these three methods. So, uh, so different methods is also uh, sensitive to different parts of the MF. Uh, for example, the Kernicket uh, method and the isotope abundance ratio method are sensitive to uh, massive stars, while the gravitational sensitive features give uh, um, it's an index for the uh, low mass stars. So I will talk about them separately. First, uh, let's look at the uh, MF for massive stars. The Kennedy method is uh, basically looking at the H alpha equi equivalent OS and uh, its relation with the color index of a galaxy. So the uh, black points, so, so the black counter here is the uh, 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 SDSS galaxy. So each point is a galaxy. And uh, the line here is the evolution track of a uh, single galaxy along this plot. So as the uh, galaxy becomes older, it's uh, move uh, along this line. Now in order to explain the uh, uh, scatter uh, of, of this plot, you try to modify different parameters uh, in your galaxy evolution model. Uh, for example, the star formation history, the uh, extinction exact, and uh, what people find is that uh, uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, the uh, modifications mostly uh, shift this uh, evolution track along this uh, direction, along this direction of the uh, evolution itself. So it doesn't help to expand the scatter in the perpendicular direction. And the only thing 
that uh, uh, can explain it is to modify the IMF of the Hamas stars. And that is uh, shown in the three uh, in the line in the three line with different colors. So the green line is uh, the is when you assume a canonical IMF, and the blue and red line is when you assume a flatter and a steeper IMF, respectively. And more interestingly is that when you uh, look at the uh, IMF slope. Uh, suggested by this method and uh, the star formation rate of the galaxy, you, you see that there is a correlation. So for the uh, higher star formation rate galaxy, it has a flatter uh, MF. A similar method uh, is uh, called the Boat method, which is to look at the uh, H alpha luminosity and uh, compare it with the uh, ultraviolet uh, luminosity. And here you also have kind of a color magnitude diagram. So from these uh, two dimensions, uh, it is possible to give uh, you a constraint on the um, MF as a function of uh, star formation rate of the galaxy. So if you plot these uh, two diagnoses uh, together, you see that it forms a continuous uh, trend. So for higher star formation rate galaxies, you have a flatter MF and for lower, so, so dwarf galaxies with low star formation rate, you, you don't have many massive stars. So this shows a systematic variation correlated with the star formation intensity. And uh, what about uh, more uh, intense uh, star formation regions? So starburst galaxies. So uh, in these regions, uh, these newly formed stars are still uh, embedded in, in the dust. So we need to uh, utilize the uh, infrared uh, observation to uh, get a handle of them. And uh, this work is done by Romano and Jiyu. Uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, to look at the uh, isotope ratio of uh, these galaxies. And basically, different isotopes are produced by uh, different mass of uh, stars. So it gives you an indicator on the MF slope. Uh, and here it's uh, plotted the isotope ratio versus the uh, infrared luminosity, which is an indicator of star formation rate. And you see, again, a systematic train uh, going all the way uh, from uh, this SMC to uh, SMDs. So that is crossing uh, five uh, luminosity magnitudes. So the problem, uh, or let's say the uncertainty of this uh, method is how, how do you translate the uh, isotope ratio to the MF slope? And that depends on your assumed uh, stellar evolution model. So again, this uh, indicator is indirect. Uh, the good news is since this uh, uh, trend uh, continues to a lower star formation with galaxies, we can compare it with our earlier uh, measurements. And since we, uh, it is more certain that, that this uh, relation is caused by uh, MF variation. We can see that um, uh, the isotope ratio indicator overlap with, uh, with the uh, Kronikant method is uh, probably also caused by uh, MF variation. So this is a systematic variation uh, crossing nine magnitude. Uh, now I will talk about the uh, low mass stars. Uh, like I said, uh, so we, we need to talk about them separately because uh, in order to observe the low mass stars, you cannot observe the uh, star forming galaxies as the luminosity will be dominated by massive stars. So we observe the quiescent uh, ellipticals. Now there are uh, Gravitational sensitive features. 
in the uh, fact that uh, uh, tells you the uh, ratio between uh, dwarf stars and, and giant stars. So if you measure this uh, uh, spectral features, it can give you a uh, estimation on the time half slope of the low mass stars uh, as a function of uh, 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 galaxy mass or uh, its mentalicity and the uh, tight, uh, tightest uh, relation, a uh, correlation is, uh, is with mentalicity here. So there are many uh, publications confirming this uh, result using similar method. And uh, basically it shows that the, uh, the MF of uh, early type of galaxy is uh, uh, varying uh, with uh, its mentalicity. Now, uh, I, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, important to uh, realize that this uh, MF change is only about the low mass star, it's not about massive stars, because these uh, quiescent galaxies you observe don't contain any massive stars. So, from this uh, empirical relation, it is uh, reasonable to assume a MF variation like this. So the low mass part of the MF is changing, but for the high mass part, you assume the canonical MF. So this assumption doesn't affect your uh, stellar population synthesis and uh, uh, your observation is also not uh, constrained the uh, high mass part. But uh, in some literature, you, you see uh, such uh, assumptions, which is not uh, uh, properly uh, reasoned, let's say. Um, so, uh, so these uh, people uh, haven't uh, realized that uh, for, uh, so they assume that the MF above uh, 0.5 solar mass is changing, which also affects the, uh, your, your stellar population synthesis because you change the MF uh, between 0.5 to one, but it's uh, not supported that this, uh, trend is continuing for the massive stars. Now, finally, I point you to a more uh, comprehensive uh, uh, introduction on the history and the current state of the MF measurement. It's a, it's a dialogue between Teresa and Andrew uh, about two months ago. And as both of them uh, concluded and uh, Hopkins uh, put it beautifully that uh, we need to move on from is the MF universal to how does the MF vary. And with that, I finished the first part of my talk. So we do know that the MF is uh, not universal. For the next part, I will introduce you the uh, integrated galaxy-wide MF theory, which is a framework to explain the uh, MF variation. Now, it's uh, not difficult to uh, understand. So the IGMF theory considers the fact that uh, all stars are formed in star clusters. So if you add up all the uh, stars in star clusters you, uh, in a galaxy, then you end up with the MF of a galaxy-wide uh, MF. So this is the empirical uh, MF of stars in a star cluster I introduced earlier. And similarly, you can have an empirical uh, mass distribution of uh, star clusters in a galaxy. So if you integrate this two functions, according to the IDMF theory, you, uh, you get the galaxy-wide IMF prediction. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this is, uh, So on the right side is uh, galaxies with higher star formation rates. So this is 10 to the four solar mass per year. And they have a flatter uh, MF slope. So more massive stars. And for the low star formation rate galaxy on the left, they don't have much of uh, massive stars. And also the mentalicity is uh, affecting the galaxy wide MF for low mentalicities on the bottom. You don't form much of uh, low mass stars. And for high mentalicity on the top, 
So how does this compare with observation? Uh, again, we plot the, uh, so the high mass, um, so the Apollo index for high mass stars as a function of star formation rate. And if you remember, uh, this is uh, our uh, empirical uh, high mass variations. It uh, fits quite well. So the point is, if you if you look at the evidence separately, uh, it seems that you have uh, other uh, options to to explain the uh, to explain your observation other than the uh, MF variation. But uh, when you look at uh, the smaller scale and large scale together, it's uh, very difficult to find an alternative solution other than the MF variation. So this uh, gives. Uh, here I show the uh, equations. So this MF, uh, IGMF equation is basically a convolution between the uh, uh, MF of stars in the star cluster and the mass function of uh, in best. And this is uh, all the equations you need to uh, for the uh, star clusters, and this is uh, for the entire galaxy. You see that uh, there's only two free parameters in these equations. It's the mentalicity and the star formation rate. Uh, so the mean star formation rate of the galaxy over 10 million years. And uh, we already developed a, a open source code to uh, implement this. So you don't need to do it so yourself if uh, you're interested. So in summary, the IMF is not universal. And uh, so it must be defined for specific space and the time scale. For the star clusters, the uh, stellar mass distribution is given by IMF and star cluster is forming in time scale about uh, one million year. And for a population of uh, star clusters, uh, the embedded cluster mass function is uh, populated in about 10 million years. And if you integrate the MF with the embedded cluster mass function, you got the uh, galaxy-wide MF. And that is also defined in a time scale of about 10 million years. So the IGMF theory is a link between uh, MF at different scales. And, this, uh, and its prediction depends on your uh, applied uh, empirical uh, MF variation. So what we uh, applied uh, in the formulation is the uh, Max et al. Uh, 2012 uh, formulation. Uh, given by the uh, embody simulations. Now in the third part, I will uh, implement the IGMF theory into a galaxy chemical evolution. So uh, that is the uh, first thing you, you would want to do. So since the MF is it's changing, let's see how it affects the uh, chem chemical evolution of a galaxy. So for uh, the most uh, simplified uh, galaxy chemical evolution model, you should have at least uh, three different phases. That is the gas, the star, and the stellar remnants. So the gas can uh, form stars, and the stars, uh, when, when they die, they, they return uh, to the gas phase, and they also form stellar remnants. And the uh, white dwarfs can, uh, become, uh, can generate type IA supernova. So add more things to, to the gas phase. So with this, uh, you can involve the galaxy. So basically it's a, it's a machine. If you, uh, uh, if you give the uh, initial gas condition and star formation rule, it will tell you the uh, galaxy property at a later time. Now the question is how to uh, implement the IGMF. So that is, uh, 
uh, we use the uh, galaxy-wide star formation rate and gas-based mentalicity at each time step to calculate a galaxy-wide IMF and return it to the uh, galaxy chemical evolution model. So at each time step, the star, when the star forms, it forms according to a different galaxy-wide IMF. Uh, and there is an uh, uh, additional thing uh, we need to uh, remember that not all the remnants will form uh, type 1A supernova. So, uh, for example, the black holes and neutron star won't. Now, when you change the uh, MF, this is something uh, you need to be uh, careful about. So, the type 1A supernova is only correlated with uh, potential. Uh, progenitors, that is uh, stars, uh, with initial mass between about 1.5 to 8 solar mass. And here is the equation to, to calculate how, much, uh, how many uh, type 1 supernova will, be, will explode in for stellar population. And uh, basically, the, here you can see the first term tells you how many stars are within the mass range of 1.5 to 8 solar mass per uh, unit uh, stellar mass. So this is the total mass of the uh, uh, stellar population. And the second, second term tells you how, how many of such stars will form a binary. The third term is the uh, probability of, uh, of the companion star also uh, have the uh, correct, uh, also with the mass range. The final term uh, gives you the final uh, realization uh, fraction. So how many of these systems will end up with uh, type 1 supernova eventually? So it's uh, clear that these two terms uh, depends on the MF, and these two terms depends on the environment. So for example, if your uh, star formation region is uh, pretty dense, it is possible that you have a higher uh, binary fraction. Uh, a warning here, so uh, the analytical formulation uh, is not pliable without recalibration when applying a different IMF. So, so for example, the uh, Grigor 2005 uh, formulation uh, assumes that uh, the total number of type 1 supernova is uh, uh, expressed by this uh, formulation. So um, such a, a formulation is correct if the MF is universal and you don't change the MF. So once you uh, uh, apply a different MF, the, uh, because this, uh, this formulation is not correlated with the uh, potential uh, supernova progenitors, so you need to recalibrate the uh, the total number. And here is the uh, correct uh, equation again. Uh, here I plot the uh, number of uh, supernova in 10 billion years per uh, unit mass of a uh, stellar population. So that is about uh, two supernova per 1,000 solar mass formed. And uh, you can see with this uh, formulation, when you assume different IMF, this uh, number changes. Now, since uh, uh, in the prediction of IGMF theory, we have uh, the galaxy-wide IMF as a function of star formation rate and mentalicity. So here, if I assume the mentalicity to be uh, solar mentalicity, uh, it's only a function of a star formation rate of the galaxy. You see that for the uh, high star formation rate galaxy, it forms a lot of massive stars, so it's not helping uh, to, to form type 1A supernova, so the uh, type 1A supernova number decreases. For the low star formation rate galaxies, uh, most of stars is uh, smaller than 1.5 solar mass, so it also doesn't form much. Uh, uh, type 1A supernova. And you can see here uh, at the uh, solar mentalicity and uh, star formation rate about 
the same as Milky Way. Uh, the prediction uh, goes back to the canonical IMF. Now it's, uh, it's plot when you change uh, the mentalicity. So uh, for the low mass stars, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it is strongly affected by, uh, by mentalicity because uh, at, at the, uh, low, for the low mass IMF, so for these galaxies, it's not forming uh, many massive stars. And for the low mass stars, the low mass IMF is affected strongly by the uh, mentalicity as suggested by uh, the um, uh, observation of uh, quiescent el elliptical galaxies. Now this uh, prediction would change if we uh, modify the uh, related uh, uh, mass limit, so 1.5 solar mass gear. So you will also see in the publication that the uh, this mass range is start from two solar mass or start from three solar mass. So let's see how it uh, looks when, when when we change it to three solar mass. You see that uh, the type, uh, type one supernova for the dwarf galaxy is uh, suppressed because uh, uh, less stars is uh, is is formed uh, above the solar mass. And finally, these two terms, uh, it's uh, environmental dependent. So for the uh, high star formation rate galaxies uh, with in intense star formation rate and uh, high mentalicity, it's possible that uh, these two terms will change. So for example, the, when, when the mentalicity is high, uh, the uh, radii of a uh, uh, companion star will be larger and it helps uh, for the matter to, to upgrade from the companion star to the primary. So the parameter P here will, will be larger. So you can imagine that this, uh, this function might uh, increasing uh, for the uh, high star for the galaxies. Uh, and finally, for a complete uh, equation set, uh, there is actually uh, two terms when you consider the uh, star uh, type one supernova rate at a certain time. So previously, I introduced the uh, total number of uh, type one supernova uh, in 10 billion years. And uh, for a given time, you also need to consider the delay time distribution, uh, even by uh, a power law, for example. And finally, you need to uh, calibrate this uh, uh, equation with the observation. So we observe the uh, nearby systems and count how many type 1 supernova are there. So when the uh, assumed IMF and uh, environment uh, is the same as uh, the solar neighborhood, we expect uh, about two type 1 supernova per uh, southern solar. So that is a complete uh, view of uh, our code that to implement the IGM theory into galaxy chemical evolution. Now we can uh, apply it to different uh, uh, systems. I will talk about the uh, ellipticals first. Uh, the, um, so here I show the observation of the uh, abundance ratio and uh, so Mg over uh, magnesium over iron and the total mentalicity as a function of uh, galaxy mass. So for high mass uh, ellipticals, it, has, uh, it, it is more mental rich and more alpha enhancement, more alpha enhanced. And there is a longstanding uh, problem is that the uh, cosmological Simulations cannot reproduce these two observations simultaneously, as it's shown in, in this uh, red model. So when you have uh, 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 this uh, metallicity fitted, uh, it seems the, uh, the upper elements are not uh, as much as the observation suggests. 
So if you want uh, more uh, upper elements to iron peak elements ratio, uh, one way is to reduce the star formation rate, uh, star formation time scale of the galaxy. So uh, because the uh, type 1a supernova that produce uh, uh, more than half of the uh, iron elements uh, will come uh, at a later time. So if you reduce the star formation time scale, this ratio becomes higher. And that is uh, the way you can introduce a high, uh, a higher uh, stellar feedback. So energy feedback in the systems and it quench the star. Area. So that's how you can, you can get a higher uh, MD or IP ratio. The problem is when the star formation time scale is, is too short, the gas uh, doesn't have enough time to uh, recycle and enrich. So you end up with a lower uh, total mentalicity. So that is the problem. And it's not only that uh, we don't know how the uh, stellar uh, feedback works, it's that uh, no matter how, how the stellar feedback works, we, we cannot uh, fit the observation of these two, uh, these two observations simultaneously. So there are many possible solutions. You, you, can, you can change the uh, MF for start. So if you have a more top-heavy MF with, with more massive stars, of course you end up with more uh, higher mentalicity and uh, more alpha elements. So it certainly helps to, to solve this problem. But of course, you can, you can change a bunch of uh, other things. Uh, I will not go into the details. Uh, so that is the... So that is the uh, first uh, first observational cons constraint is to is to fit the uh, total mentalicity and the alpha enhancement of these galaxies, and uh, it suggests a higher uh, uh, and excess of uh, massive stars when the galaxy forms. Now we have seen previously that the gravitation, gravitation no sensitive features uh, indicates an axis of low mass stars for uh, more massive ellipt ellipticals with uh, higher mentalicity. So this seems to suggest that initially uh, top heavy with more massive stars and uh, at the present day it somehow uh, becomes uh, bottom heavy with, with more low mass stars. So we, we, we run uh, a simple uh, simulation assuming the IGMF theory and uh, a log normal, uh, so a, a starburst uh, star formation history. So that is the uh, most uh, simple assumption you can have uh, as also supported by the uh, standard population synthesis of, of the ellipticals. So uh, we can predict how the uh, galaxy-wide IMF uh, involves. So this is the uh, first time step, the, the galaxy-wide IMF for the first time step, um, because in the beginning, it has a very poor mental density, so you don't form much of uh, low mass stars. And since it has a high star formation rate, you, you form uh, more massive stars. And as the time involves, the mentalicity is enriched, so you form more and more uh, low mass stars, and the star formation rate is still high, so you, you form also more massive stars. And um, yes, so this is at, at, at about uh, one or two giga years. Uh, the star formation rate uh, is uh, decreasing, and so you stop forming massive stars, and uh, now you only form uh, low mass stars. So, th so this is a time integrated uh, uh, galaxy wide IMF. So, okay. So, at, at certain giga year, you see that the uh, IMF is bottom heavy with an axis of low mass stars. And uh, for the high mass stars, of course, uh, you cannot observe them at the present day because 
they have a short lifetime. You can only observe uh, stars uh, below about one solar mass. But uh, when the galaxy forms, they do have uh, access of uh, massive stars. So this uh, checks uh, both of the observational constraints. That is to have uh, access of a low mass star at the present day and also uh, access of high mass star during the uh, formation of the galaxy. So the IDMF theory can uh, at least uh, quantitatively account for the uh, spectrum of the uh, massive ellip ellipticals. Uh, now I, I talk about my second uh, example that is uh, an application on the ultra fan dwarf galaxy in Buddhist fan. And this is published in our, uh, uh, this year. Our so, uh, Yes, so with intrinsically two uh, adjustable parameters, we are able to fit for independent uh, observations and also agree with the typical gas depletion time scale of galaxies. Uh, I'm not going to details, it's just saying that uh, the IGM theory fits the observation very nicely. But the point I want to make is that uh, so here you see the uh, observation of uh, uh, element ratio element abundance ratio uh, and this is the uh, evolution track of uh, of the simulated galaxy sorry so in order to fit this uh, this plot uh, there is two uh, key uh, parameters uh, the first one is uh, the relative uh, time scale of the star formation of, of the galaxy and the time scale of the type 1a supernova that start to uh, contribute. So if you have a shorter uh, star formation time scale, you will have a higher uh, alpha element to iron peak element uh, abundance ratio. And also uh, the second uh, uh, thing that uh, affects this uh, evolution track is the assumed uh, MF. So of course, if you have a more top-heavy MF, you end up with a higher uh, uh, alpha element abundance. This uh, galaxy-wide MF predicted by the uh, IJMF series. So basically, uh, let's only look at the uh, thick uh, black line here. Uh, in comparison with the canonical MF in red, so the IDMF theory predicts that the dwarf galaxy should have a more uh, a top light MF, so less massive stars. And this is inconsistent with the observation that these galaxies have uh, a very short star formation time scale. So the star formation time scale of this galaxy is uh, determined uh, independently by uh, stellar population synthesis studies. And uh, they suggest that this galaxy should form in about 100 million years. And with that short uh, star formation time scale, you have to have a Top light MF in order to fit this uh, evolution, uh, in order to fit the uh, abundance ratio plot. So this confirms that the uh, galaxy wide MF is top light. And uh, here is just a, a table of the parameters we, we fit in comparison with an earlier uh, publication. So, uh, it, 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 so we fit uh, um, better for, for, for some uh, parameters and uh, a similar for the total, uh, uh, for the mean metallicity of the stars. And here we see that this, uh, this fit is not uh, perfect. We have a lower uh, mean metallicity. So it's still within the two sigma and sigma range, but but uh, it is lower than the uh, observation suggests. So one thing you can uh, 
And one additional thing you can address is that is the um, low mass uh, IMF slope. So in the IGMF formulation, we assume that uh, this slope, so alpha one and alpha two are the slope of uh, stars uh, between uh, 0.1 to, to one solar mass, so for the low mass stars. And we assume the, their IMF slope is correlated with the mentalicity of the galaxy. And if, you, if we adjust this uh, parameter, we can, we can fit this uh, uh, mentalicity measurements perfectly. So that, that is the uh, model shown here. So in conclusion, uh, uh, so, so this, uh, this adjustment suggests that the lower, uh, uh, the MF for the low mass uh, stars should be uh, flatter, so less uh, low mass stars. So if you have less low mass stars, you increase your mentalicity. So in conclusion, uh, given the short star formation time scale and uh, abundance ratio, we, uh, we can conclude that uh, the Buddhist one should have a top light IMF. And given the top light IMF and the uh, measured uh, mean stellar metallicity, we conclude that it should have uh, also a bottom light IMF. So it should be both uh, bottom light and uh, top light. This uh, shows the uh, capability of uh, ultrafront uh, dwarf uh, galaxies to constrain the IMF variation law. Now we can do this because uh, UFDs have, have a relative uh, simple star formation history and especially the star formation time scale is very short. So we can constrain separately for, for the top part and the bottom part of the IMF. So I can show more applications. So this I have already introduced in my talk. And we also uh, implement the IGMF theory with uh, Cosmic Census, uh, published uh, also this year. It's interesting that uh, it seems that the IGMF theory accounts for the uh, Cosmic Census problem. And also we are working on uh, to, to implement the IGMF theory to a, population, a stellar population synthesis code and also uh, hydrodynamic code, and probably uh, more in the future. So uh, the uh, IGMF part of, of, of these applications, uh, you can find uh, or you can use uh, our uh, open source uh, GAL IMF code published in 2017. Some final thoughts. Uh, for the uh, IGMF theory, the IGMF theory accounts for the observation for both star forming and passive galaxies. Uh, the coming work will further refine and constrain the empirical stellar MF and uh, embedded cluster mass function variation law applied in the uh, IGMF formulation. So like I said, this, these two empirical law are, uh, still have some uncertainties to be uh, refined. Uh, and secondly, uh, to do that, uh, a development of new methods such as the isotope ratio indicator will be important. Also, the chemical evolution study of the uh, dwarf galaxies seem to be very promising. For the uh, galaxy chemical evolution studies, um, to, to decrease the, uh, the uncertainty of such studies, the uh, stellar model consider, uh, for example, stellar rotation and a non-solar initial composition uh, still needs to be uh, developed. Uh, other major uncertainties uh, come from the Taipei supernova rate. Uh, it may vary as a function of IMF and the star formation environment. And also the hydrodynamic uh, evolution of the gas is very uncertain. And that, uh, uh, concludes my talk and I'm open for questions. Thanks, Zhiqiang. Um, so now we have time for two short questions. Anyone who has a question, uh, you can use the raise hand function via Zoom so I can see you. Uh, 
actually, I would like to ask one, Zhichang. So uh, when you um, uh, mentioned the Buddhist one, magnesium yes. of iron evolution, you said it is uh, it is top uh, it is top light at the very beginning, right? I expect that magnesium over iron abundance at the very beginning should be lower than what we observe in in the Milky Way. So, but oh, you, uh, mean, you, mean bottom, you mean bottom line? Yeah, yeah, bottom line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so sorry, uh, I thought it's a uh, uh, top line. Yes, yes. Uh, or, uh, right, right. Top oh, line, I was top wrong. Line. Yeah, so so uh, the predictions that the dwarf galaxy should be top light, so less massive stars. Yeah, and, if it uh, is less massive stars, the the yeah. the magnesium of of iron abundance should be lower at the very beginning. I mean, at the very low abundance, right? Yes, yes. Um, in that other situation, because I see the magnesium of iron is still zero point five something in the plot. Yes, yes. Zero point five yes, is uh, very high. So, so uh, the thing is, uh, 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 can you see my screen right yes, now? Yes, yes. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, even though it's uh, uh, top light, the most massive star is still about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, several tens of solar mass, maybe yes. 50, 50 solar mass. Yes. And uh, if, you, if you check the uh, uh, abundance, uh, so the chemical yield of of such stars, it starts at this point. So the uh, lower uh, uh, abundance ratio you usually see in the simulation of Milky Way is actually uh, average over a longer time scale and uh, it's not accounting for the first star formed in that galaxy. And also uh, it, it's uh, affected by the uh, mass uh, inflow. Okay, I see. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, that's uh, my question. So, uh, um, if any other questions? If there are not, uh, thanks again. Thanks, Zhixiang, again for, for the nice talk. And thanks all for joining the talk. And thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. For Bye. Thanks.